So with that, everyone, welcome uh, to our monthly webinar. So this is a big one. This is our, our mid-year market update, Everything Markets. Uh, we have Marianne Bartels back with us. She is the Chief Investment Officer at Sanctuary Wealth. Uh, she has been uh, a strategist and analyst that I've been following uh, since my career at Merrill Lynch, because uh, we coincided and, and overlapped there together. Uh, I owe her to a semiconductor trade that uh, we went with many years ago and have been uh, big proponents and, and big followers of your strategies, recommendations, and just overall analysis of the market. So, Marianne, thank you very much for, for joining us here today. Oh, it's absolutely my pleasure, and thank you for having me back. I appreciate it. Yes. So, there, there's a lot going on at present politically with markets, interest rates, et cetera. Uh, I want to make sure that we hit on that today. Uh, I, and I just want to remind individuals that um, you can put a question or two inside of the chat. There's a chat feature and there's a q and A. I'm going to do my best to monitor that. And uh, if I see something that is relevant, I, I will be happy to, to kind of key that up. So this is going to be interactive. I have a few questions I'd like Marianne to kind of go through. And then I have some charting up here that we can uh, look at on the screen. Uh, I think I'm first just going to throw a very easy one up there, which is the overall bond market and then the U.S. stock market. I'll key up here as well. But Marianne, why don't you start with, if you reflect on this year, the last six months, are there any surprises from what you thought were going to transpire January 1 of this year, you know, looking back on that now? So when we entered the year, um, our year ahead report was called the bucking bull. We expected both equities and fixed income to have a bull year, but it wouldn't be an easy straight ride. I would say equities have really been the easier ride um, for the first half of the year, but we do believe that interest rates have peaked for this cycle, will continue to fall. We're expecting the Fed to cut interest rates in September by 25 basis points. And this is really going to allow the bond market now to perform well between here and uh, the end of the year. So we're, we're in a bull market. I expected a bull market. I was looking for mega caps to outperform. They have. We were looking right. for semiconductors to lead. They have. So I haven't really seen any major surprises um, so far this year based on our original outlook. So you mentioned bonds. Um, if you're looking over the, the from now to the end of the year, um, would it be fair to say you would be bonds over cash over the next six months, bonds over cash over the next three years, what's your thought there? Because right now, risk-free or high-interest money markets that we leverage and access for clients here at Fidelity are yielding 5%. Um, thoughts on cash versus bonds now into the end of the year, even beyond that? So if I'm comparing cash to bonds at this stage, because we're looking for the Fed to cut rates, these cash levels are going to come down, that we would take this as an opportunity to move cash into fixed income. So I, I think that would be um, the best move for where we are in the interest rate cycle. But when we look at um, stocks versus bonds versus cash, mm -hmm. I'm still overweight equities versus fixed income and cash. Okay. So what I'm charting here is the 10-year treasury yield, and then we also have the performance of the overall broad market bonds. So on a year-to-date basis, the 10-year treasury is actually up 7.5%. The bond market's up 1%. Um, second half of the year, you might see the 10-year yield decrease a little bit associated with the rate cut. So would we have a chart that looks a little bit more like if we take this over the last one year, um, where we see a little bit more bond performance here, or even a little bit better than that? What would be the expectation? So... With the with the market anticipating the Fed to cut rates, you've really seen the front end of the curve come down more and the back mm -hmm. end of the curve come down, but not as much. So I would expect, especially if the economy begins to really slow down, that back end of the curve is going to come down. So I still think you're going to see rates come down. I think you could see 3% on a 10-year at some point. Oh, and that's wow. significant. That's that significant. Is, that's big. Mm-hmm. Over now, what okay, period? So, all right. So in let the me next let 12 me put, months. That's a big statement. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've actually thought rates could go to two and a half percent. I said that a couple of years ago. 
why would I even say two and a half percent? We have to understand the cycle of interest rates. The cycle is 20 to 30 years. In this particular case, it was 40 years from the peak in 1980 to the actual lows that we saw in uh, 2020, 2021. Mm -hmm. And I believe that that was a generational low. And now we're going into a cycle for higher interest rates. However, cycles have cycles within them. And so the short-term cycle is for rates to come down. But I do think over time rates will go up. But when I look at the trend line, and this you're not going to have this, but I don't think from the peak in 1980 to the lows of 20 and 21, that trend line on the 10-year is around 2.5%. Normally, that level gets tested at some point. So if it's not two and a half, it's three percent. So I think we're in a cycle. Oh, you do have it. Look at it. you, fancy uh, pants. <laughs> There's a trend line that you can draw from the second. Well, actually, what forget date do you about want? The I can I can peaks. get a date here. You want 1980? You don't even have to do 1980. You can pass the two big peaks, and you see the channel that goes because mm -hmm. I can't see what year that is. Exactly, it's the early 80s. That channel okay. that's very clearly down. Yeah. If you just draw that trend line, that comes out to be about two and a half. Okay. Okay. And so I think we're testing the breakout level. Mm -hmm. And that would, in order to get two and a half percent, we would have to have a recession at some point. That's not going to happen in a, in a growing economy. Um, the economy is clearly showing signs of slowing. We are seeing um, unemployment tick up. In fact, it's actually ticked, ticked up quite a bit. We've gone from uh, unemployment rate of 3.4, which was a record, to 4.1. Uh, we are seeing uh, jobless claims rise. Uh, so we are seeing the economy slow, but the consumer is still spending, again, slowing. Right. If the Fed is late cutting rates, we will have a recession at some point. And if we're going to have a recession, it's not this year. I think it's next year. And I'm more I, concerned about next year than I am this year. I'm still very bullish this year. Okay. The first year of a president's um, first year out of, out of out of four years is normally the worst for markets. So why is that? We can do this logically. Because you're going to implement all the policies that voters don't like. You can do that in your first year. It's not going to, even if your ratings go down, it's not going to hurt you or, or the party. So generally, the policies that are considered not, not, not the most popular by voters wind yeah. up getting implemented in, in the first year. You generally have a choppy market, not necessarily a bad market, but not necessarily a great market. Um, but I'm not worried about that. Why am I not worried about that? Because when I take the longer term view, we're still in a secular bull market. Just like interest rates had a cycle for 40 years, equities have cycles for 15 to 20 years. We went into a new secular bull market in 2013 for the S&P. For NASDAQ, that was 2017. And I think our markets will stay in a secular bull market until about 2029, 2030. Mm -hmm. And after that, then we're going to go into a secular bear market. We don't stay in secular bulls forever. Right. Um, I do think it's going to be driven by AI. I do think it's going to be driven by mega cap. Okay. So this AI cycle. So, you know, the news yesterday, um, th the concern that um, we're going to be tough on semiconductors, we're going to be tough on Taiwan there's going to be tariffs. The way I look at this, again, I try to be very logical. If we want to have an AI cycle and grow that technology, you can't do it without AI chips. And that's mm -hmm. NVIDIA. You need a manufacturer. Who's that? That's Taiwan Semiconductor. But these stocks are up a tremendous amount. If you just use the ETF alone, uh, yeah. the ETF this year is up 50%. You know, stocks like NVIDIA have been up over 100 percent. It, it's not sustainable to go vertical. You're going to get corrections and pullbacks. And I think that's what we're going to get 
uh, between now and September and October. I think we're in the early stages of, of that correction. Um, but I think we have a strong rally at the back half of the year. So I still think the market can close up 20% for the year. Wow. Okay. So I have year-to-date semiconductor ETF, SMH, and then I have the S&P 500, and then growth on a year-to-date basis. And yeah, what we've seen in the last five days or even the last month, semiconductors down almost seven, S&P's up two, growth is only up 0.3. So this is that choppiness that you mentioned that could be a temporary correction, but um, an eventual larger trend. And if we if we go three year, we can see it pretty clearly, the dominance of the semiconductors relevant to uh, the S&P and, and growth, which are pretty much the same performance. So the S&P is edging out growth just on a three year, 35 to 32%, but the semi is up a 110. Correct. So I do think it's gonna stay growth over value, but you do get periods where value will out, outperform. In a down tape, value is going to outperform because you're getting the correction in technology. But I do believe that we will stay in an AI-driven market. And to compare market cycles, right, things repeat never exactly the same. I think we're, in, in terms of technology cycle, very similar to 1995, where we were starting to really see signs of productivity enhancements from computers coming into the business and also having the internet start entering in. So mm -hmm. if you look at the market from 1995 to 2000, you really didn't get bubblicious until the last year. Right. So I don't even think we're bubblicious yet in the markets. I think they will get bubblicious. In fact, I've compared the NASDAQ to the markets of the 1920s. Mm -hmm. I think we're, I think NASDAQ, because it houses so much technology and um, AI, that that will outperform the S&P 500 and can have a vertical move that looks very similar to what we saw during uh, the late 1920s. But remember, when that party ends and when that when party ended, bursts. when the bubble bursts, it's very painful, which is why it's very important to have a discipline to rebalance. Um, but I do think we're, we will get bubblicious. I don't even think we're bubblicious yet. Okay. Wow. So I, you, you brought up the election, which I want to circle back to. Let's stay on kind of the growth and value. Um, it, it, what's driving, say, the last month where we've actually seen a little bit of a flip? It's really been more recently the last week or two. Um, is this the, more of a, hey, you know, Growth can't just grow nonstop. There's got to be a pullback. There's got to be a correction. Or do you think there's reason for the growth pullback or at least, you know, the the, the value starting to take over the dividends just if we're looking the last month? So it, it seems like you don't believe this is going to be a trend. This is temporary. But what's creating this temporary issue? And then uh, if I can, I'll throw in small cap to that because that's something that in the last month really has jump small caps up 10 percent values up four and a half growth is flat what's happened in the last month that would lead us to to, to kind of indicate why so let's tackle small cap first that's that's the okay. easier one sure. um small caps were very cheap um but you just don't rally because you're cheap when the mar when we got the cpi report last thursday i think it was um, and the market started to price in lower interest rates. We saw a major trade unwind by fast money. These are hedge fund CTAs that had a very long QQQ ETF on, and they had a short or a hedge of the Russell 2000 small cap. And the small cap started to rally on the anticipation of lower rates they had a massive short position that they have been covering. Mm -hmm. You know, fundamentally, you just don't go up 12% in five days. Right. That is what we call a massive short squeeze. And we've had a massive short squeeze. Is it all squeezed out yet? We may not have the complete squeeze out yet. There might be a little bit more to this trade. 
The question is, are you getting a fundamental shift away from uh, large cap to small cap? And I don't believe we are. Um, what a lot of people don't remember is during the 1995 to 2000 period, small cap did not perform well as mm -hmm. this whole um, tech trade went uh, from 1995 in, into the bubble of, of 2000. Then after 2000, small cap outperformed. Small mm -hmm. cap has had a major bull market for a long time. It entered a bear market just about a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago, it went into a bear market. Small caps are actually in a bear market. Many of those companies are not even as profitable as the companies that are in the S&P 500. So I still think that this is a temporary move in small cap, that the majority of the companies that are actually earning strong earnings and will continue to have strong growth um, are in the tech space, not the only space. I also like industrials, I like energy, but I think the majority is going to be in tech. Now, with that said, growth had a significant outperformance relative to value. Mm -hmm. That's not sustainable. You get some mean reversion. Now, yeah. part of the trigger, I do think, is, is a Trump bump. Um, now, now, what do I mean by that? During um, the debate, which everybody knows about, I think, by now, between uh, former President Trump and President Biden, uh, it didn't go well for Biden. Right. And the market started to price in a Trump win. And, you know, your, your your clients can watch this. It's it's all on the Internet. We don't allow betting here in the United States, but there's betting outside of the United States. So one of the polls that I'm watching comes from a company called Predict It, IT, and it's predictit.com. And um, you started to see after that debate, Trump starting to really move um, in, in, in the betting sites. And then if you started to look at the polling and where I get my polling from is uh, real clear polling, you started to even see in the various polls, many of them started to see Trump, but the market priced it in right away. And I would say since that time, the market has continued uh, to increase that Trump by, uh, bias. And then over the weekend, when the attempted assassination was done on Trump, uh, the markets escalated that. Um, I would tell you, based on how I'm seeing the markets trade and the feeling that I'm get getting, uh, it's Trump's election to lose at this point. Okay. Right. It is still very early, though. In, in you talk to I mean, three days is is a long time in elections. Um, but the momentum and and kind of the unprecedented circumstances that we've had between Trump and then, of course, um, uh, Biden's poor performance and, and the concern of of his health um, is, is just so, so unprecedented. So I would say between now and maybe November, there's a good shot that that trade stays on, a Trump trade stays on. But then we'll have to see who gets elected. We'll have to see what policies they tackle. I would say you don't trade these things. You leave that to the professional traders. This is just markets, traders pricing in various different events. But right. what candidates say versus what they wind up doing are not always exactly the same. Mm -hmm. So it's better to have a disciplined process. But I will tell you, it's fun to talk about. Everyone is. <laughs> Everyone is. So it's, is there on Trump versus Biden, is there anything strong that you feel for equities or for bonds or for rates for one versus the other? Because I think some media and some financial media will, will, will blow it up and, and make A versus B a massive thing for markets. What's your well, feeling in that regard? So the tariffs, the big T, I think is probably one of the biggest heavyweights. Okay. Um, uh, and and, and if, if Trump was to win, uh, never before did we reelect a president, at least in my, not in my lifetime, that was already president. So we kind of knew how, how they enacted policies. So, mm -hmm. you know, Trump is likely to enact tariffs. Mm -hmm. And um, that hurts Mexico. 
that benefits India outside, just looking outside outside of the United States. Right. Um, it will benefit M and A activity. Um, the concern is it will negatively impact big tech. Um, and JD Vance does doesn't add to that. So there is concern that there will be some kind of push on very big, very big tech. Um, there's talk about going energy independent. So mm -hmm. there's the big one though in energy is exports of LNG. Uh, so I, I think energy oh, energy is going to be a little bit tricky. I think in the beginning, it could be very good for energy. Energy is the most attractive sector in within the market. The companies have the best balance sheets. They have great cash flow. So, and that's considered value in the market. If I owned a pocket of value, I would own select energy stocks for sure. Um, banks. I'm not, I still think banks are in a bear market. Um, mm -hmm. They're still heavily regulated. The Fed is looking to add to that regulation. We're not through the uh, commercial real estate cycle. That I'm not concerned in terms of big banks, but I am concerned that we will have select pockets of small banks that have uh, reg regional banks that will have a problem. What nobody paid attention to, which is shocking, is that Moody's actually put on watch um, six regional banks because of concerns about commercial real estate. Mm -hmm. So we're not if we go into a recession, those are when those things are going to start to pop up. And I am still very concerned about some of the regional banks. But think about um, bigger getting bigger. It doesn't mean that necessarily all the regional banks go away. The bigger, just big gets big. It's mm -hmm. more smaller local regional pockets that I think are a little bit more um, of, a, of a concern. Um, what else about, a tr I'm trying to think of some other things about, uh, a, oh, well, the Trump trade is he bases his performance based on the equity market. So, I mean, I, I think generally he will try to have business-friendly policies overall mm -hmm. for the market. Right. So that will be, mar markets will be very important and the behavior of markets. You brought up briefly just a little bit of international, Mexico, um, India. We're a little bit more broad-based allocators, you know, broad-based uh, international. One major change we made was a 50 was an ETF broad-based international to a broad-based developed markets international, but with a 50% hedge back to the dollar. So maybe your thoughts on, you know, that. So so this is essentially the holding year-to-date up 11%. You know, we did that seeing the dollar strengthen. What should we watch as advisors at Asperity for possibly taking that trade off the table? Meaning, when do you think the dollar could weaken and what signs would we look for uh, in tracking that? Right. Well, going back to Trump, he's obviously very negative on China and the risk is he puts higher tariffs on, on China. Um, but emerging markets remain very attractive in terms of valuations. Um, the European markets remain very attractive on valuations. And Japan, I believe, has entered a new secular bull market. So when you're doing long-term asset allocation, this is a very attractive time uh, to be owning um, international assets. Yeah, so I'm just As going to do five, the last five years at least. I could even go 10, but over the last five years, it's you know pretty clear. The S&P is up 100. You have international developed up 56, and then you have emerging markets up 22 over the last five years. I'm not sure if you want to go 10, but um, this is at least yeah, what the, I'm showing. The, yeah, yeah, this is fine. And I can explain why we've outperformed. This is actually a very important point. Um, when you look for technology companies outside of the United States, there's not many, right? I, I'm not even sure I can find 12, mm -hmm. right? There's only a handful. So the United States has been a leader in uh, in technology, and uh, we're the leader now in um, AI because the only chip right now that can do AI is the NVIDIA chip. But then you have Taiwan Semi that does the manufacturing. They are diversifying. They're building a plant in Arizona. I do believe they're trying to uh, build uh, in Japan. 
They are diversifying um, where they manufacture. So that will become less less of a, of a risk being um, close close to China. But right now, there's always concern that that uh, about China um, inv invading Taiwan. I will give you here. I will give you my personal logic. This is my personal logical viewpoint. Um, is the G7 does not want Taiwan Semiconductor to be taken over by China. So the G7 mm -hmm. will will defend um, Taiwan just to, to to maintain Taiwan Semiconductor and its manufacturing. That's my logical um, answer. So I, I I don't lose sleep sleep over that. Um, in and, and and there's always. So what I was saying is technology has been the leader. Um, we are the leader. And that really explains the outperformance for the S&P 500. I think the risk is, is that continues out into the back half of, of the decade. But once we peak in tech, and we will, you will see the U.S. underperform. Mm -hmm. And But you never know about timing. I could be totally wrong. So I think it's very good to have an asset allocation discipline that you stick with. As for currencies, believe it or not, if you study currencies over a 10-year time frame, there's generally no change at all. However, within those 10 years, there's a lot of volatility. And currently right now, I think the dollar can be stronger. And that's because we have a stronger economy. We have stronger tech. There is concern, though, that Trump will try to devalue the currency, uh, not just Trump, but also J.D. Vance, because they want to have exports. But what I will tell you is if you look at currencies over a 30, 40, 50 year, currencies have been depreciating the whole time, including the U.S. dollar. It, it's been a race to the bottom for all currencies, believe it or not. Um, but there tends to be all this volatility. And so having a hedge in terms of your investments, I think is very smart because it will lower the volatility. And personally, I do think the dollar can be stronger than what most people think because it, yes, the U.S. is lowering interest rates, but we haven't even lowered rates. International markets have already started to lower rates. They're already in the, the, the rate cutting cycle. You've seen that in Canada. You've seen it in Switzerland. Um, you've seen it with the ECB. You've seen it in the U.K. And they've cut rates and they've seen inflation actually not come down. So, um I, I think the dollar stays strong. So I think it's very um, prudent to have at least a partial head, hedge on the investment exposure to overseas. And I didn't even talk about emerging markets, really. Yeah, you, you had mentioned emerging markets were kind of in a bear market. You know, bear markets lead to bull markets. Um, no one can predict these things. But when that bull market takes shape, it could be pretty lucrative. I know in the 2000s, emerging market performance was extremely strong when I had started my career. Um, so we have an underweight, but we still maintain a position in the emerging markets. Uh, we do have an ex-China ETF as part of our model, um, kind of trying to, to decrease the China exposure. Yeah, um, I think that's prudent. So private markets, we have about a 15% allocation, uh, 10 to 15% for, for clients. One area that we've been seeing, um, it's kind of might even fall into some of the banks. So I'm going to put up one of the funds that we're currently using, which is the Cliffwater Corporate Lending, relative to, say, even the bond market on a year-to-date basis, 7.3 versus 1.1 in the bond market. Um, you know, thoughts on alternative investments, but maybe more specifically private lending. And private lending is is really got a pretty solid opportunity as banks are a lot more stringent in terms of providing loans to businesses post 2008, 2009. Uh, you feel pretty confident in the very large banks, but do you believe they're still going to be pretty selective in the loans that they're providing? And do you see private credit or private lending or funds like this, you know, continuing to, to get a decent amount of opportunity? So there's been a major shift after the great financial crisis um, in how corporates access capital. And I don't see that changing. And that has been the the, the birth and growth of uh, private equity and private credit. Um, historically, um, these products were not really available 
um, even to wealthy clients. They just did not have um, really good products that clients um, wanted to invest in because the holding period was 10 years. You couldn't get access to li liquidity for 10 years. Um, but I would say pretty much all of the firms now have created products. You don't have daily liquidity, but you can get access, um, many of them on a quarterly basis. Mm -hmm. And um, I think there's a structural shift uh, in, in how we finance companies, but there's also a structural shift now investing in private equity and private credit. And oh, it's yeah. still very early days. Um, if, if I looked at all accounts, um, I think you'd be lucky to find um, in the wealth channel a 3% exposure to, to private markets. It's still extraordinarily low. At our firm, I think we're on averaging around 5%. Um, really, what I believe is happening is a shift very similar to where we saw pension funds um, and endowments, where they made that 20 and 30% of, of their portfolio years ago. So right. I, I continue to see uh, growth within that channel, especially as we educate clients. And that's one of the things that we've been doing is interviewing um, uh, some members of firms that are on our platform. And uh, we do have a podcast out uh, with Cliff Water and there'll be an update. I just interviewed uh, another exec uh, or the same executive actually, mm. uh, Fran from Cliff Water. And if you really listen to the product that they've created on lending, um, nothing is 100% safe. If anybody right. says something's 100% safe, please go run. Um, but and and she even said in 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 our podcast, which is not out yet, but it will be coming. You know, you do get defaults. Defaults happen. You can't afford defaults. But if you have a fully diversified portfolio, and yeah. just a few fall off, the portfolio in general continues to do really well. And that's what they're anticipating. Um, they still see. Um, a lot of potential uh, w within the lending market. And right now they don't see a lot of risk. Yeah, of, just to of, jump of in, defaults. we did a beginning of the year call with them and they set the stage for the floor on their targeted return is probably a, a plus 6%. The ceiling is probably a plus 14. So if everything goes right, probably topping out at a 14% annual return. If there are defaults, there's an economy that struggles, possible recession, those defaults are gonna eat at the yield. Uh, this fund's yielding 11%. So for us, we own the majority of it in client retirement accounts where it doesn't create an additional tax impact. But if those defaults pick up, because that yield is so strong, they really saw a plus four to plus six percent return, even in a really difficult environment with defaults. So, you know, that's that's a pretty attractive uh, spread there, and one that uh, you know we continue to allocate or continue to hold for for clients. I just was curious if you think that we have a pretty solid runway ahead of us for this space, and it sounds like sounds like we do. Yes, the answer is yes. Right. Um, well, then to kind of round off, I, I mean, I always think it's great speaking to just long-term markets and volatility. So here's the S&P 500, and I'm going back to 2011. And, and I think it's you see the general uptrend, but that's not without some pullbacks. Even in that period of time, we have COVID, uh, and then we also had the 2022 market. So, you know, it can be difficult for individuals to stay invested during those really rough times. And that's where we utilize diversification. Uh, we educate clients, run financial plans, and we even kind of do some test scenarios where we'll shock the portfolio and drop it by 10% or 20%, have a minimal to zero recovery and see if their wealth is strong enough to outlast that. Um, you know, any thoughts on, you know, how clients should think about investing in equities that, you know, you know these stats more than I do. You know, every 10 years we get a recession. Uh, we get corrections. You know, I think we're pretty long overdue for a 10% correction. Um, what are your thoughts on just behaviorally holding equities, which you're bullish on the remainder of this year, but you also sound like you wouldn't be surprised if there is a recession next year. So just thoughts on long-term holding of equity markets and how well, clients should really prepare themselves for that because behaviorally and emotionally you want it you don't want to miss out you, you want and the media kind of gets you focused on buying what's doing well 
and then um, you, you, you can only take so much pain and market drop that there's that tendency or urgency to want to sell or get out. You know, we do our best to kind of stay clients on track, keep them on track. And I think we do a great job of that. But um, some investors are nervous right now, just looking at this chart and saying, well, there's the bottom's got to fall out sometime. Um, what could you take as some parting thoughts for, for clients that are listening in or going to be watching the, the replay? So part of investing in equities is they go up, they go down. Um, when you're in a secular bull market, bear markets can be as big as 20 or 30 percent. Um, and those are painful, especially after you've, you've seen, after you've seen your portfolio up. Um, that's why it's important to have a, um, a discipline and to understand why your portfolio is allocated the way it is. That's why it's important to be di diversified. Um, I can't tell you how many clients that I have worked with over the years that sold at the bottom of 2008 and 2009 and never got back in again. You can invest based on emotions. And even if you go into um, kind of the behavioral science, the part of the brain um, when, when uh, you're having a loss is very similar to, and I know this is going to sound a little gross, but if a leg was cut off or an arm, that, that kind of pain, well, seeing your portfolio down is in that same location. And so your tendency is to react to that, right? Mm -hmm. It's a natural human behavior. So first I want people to realize that natural reaction to hit that sell button is normal. This is where you have to train yourself and educate yourself about how markets behave and how your portfolio is structured. So, you know, markets go down. Um, they go down on average three times a year, 5%, once a year, 10%, and every four years, 20 to 30%. And I find that most investors, even if you could have timed it perfectly to sell, when you call them to say buy, the news is so bad at the bottom, they cannot buy back in again. Mm -hmm. And so you risk, well, timing the markets, you risk two major mistakes. You, you risk selling too soon and not getting back in. Right. Right. You, you increase the probability. That's why when you look at compounding charts, not just the regular chart of the S&P, but that compounding of that coupon, that all gets changed as soon as you take your money out of the market. And if you miss the, a, first, a few very important days, that compounding and return drops dramatically. So it's a fool's game to time it. Again, it's fun. And I've always said, if there's a client that wants to trade, you give them a trading account and they trade that, but the bulk of their assets stay invested with a discipline. Right. No, that's great, Marianne. I did have one email pop up and it's it's regarding a recession and markets for that period. So it is, um, if, if there's a recession that you mentioned might be next year, do you see that looking like a severe reception like 08 and 09? Is there any way to tell? Thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we always remember the bad times. We always go back to that. Um, it would be nothing like 08, 09. And, and, and that's because we almost lost the whole financial system in 08, 09. Don't think people realize how bad, I mean, they know it was bad, but it was really bad. Um, our banks today, and I've always said banks are the heartbeat of the economy. Now I'm going to have to start saying banks and the private markets are adding to the heartbeat of the economy. Um, our banks are solvent. Um, th they've been stressed, stress tested. You see, they're not as aggressive giving out all, all of the lending. Um, the big banks have diversified portfolios. So a to me, a recession would be of, of normal recession. It might be one or two quarters um, okay. of mildly negative growth, but right. nothing severe. Thank you for that. Perfect. Well, just to kind of summarize, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like uh, we're pretty aligned in our thoughts. You might be maybe a little bit more allocated or extreme on growth, given everything I've read from you. Um, but in general, it seems stocks over bonds. I Correct. think it's growth over value. 
Correct. And we're talking six months is now to the down to the end of the year. U.S. over international. Yes. And bonds over cash. Correct. And if you're five percent alts, take a look at going up to ten percent. Would that be fair too? I would. That would be fair. Great. Super. Marianne, thank you very much for your time. It, it's it's very much appreciated. I always pick up a few different little nuggets from you, but more importantly, it's it's confidence. You help provide us with a little bit more confidence in what we're doing and how we're positioning clients uh, today and into the future. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you. It's my pleasure. Take care, everybody. Have Enjoy the rest of the summer. Thank you.